Every party has a pooper, that's why we invited you. Party pooper, party pooper. Some of you might recognize this little ditty from the 1991 movie Father of the Bride. George Banks, played by Steve Martin, faces a new world after his only daughter returns home from studying abroad. Her return is quickly overshadowed by an announcement. Banks's baby girl is engaged to someone she's only known for three months. Immediately, overprotective father mode initiates. From meltdowns over the whole not knowing this person longer than three months, to the injustice of hot dog to hot dog bun ratios at the grocery store, the poor man never recovers. Ultimately, Georgie is mocked by the wedding planner as he sings over the father, every party has a pooper, that's why we invited you. This infuriating song pokes at George's wounded ego. It's the aha moment that never came as Banks barrels towards disaster and self-inflicted isolation. Sound familiar? Growing up as a church brat, I never really connected with the prodigal son's experience. Of course, I had seasons where I walked away from the faith that I was raised to believe. But looking back, those seasons weren't really rebellious outrages spurred on by indignation against God. If anything, those were seasons of outrage against teachings that were not of God. It took additional seasons of unlearning to lead me to discover that our holy parent isn't on the front porch waiting for us to come home uh, with practiced apology on our lips. Rather, I've learned that God is in the stinking pig muck with us. Now, I always resonate with the older brother, the faithful son who remains at his father's side, the man-child who gets so butthurt at his sibling's return that he throws himself a pity party. Enter our party pooper. Where does this oldest son's audacity come from? It's so easy to poke fun at him and see his tantrum as a spoiled man's frustration of not being the center of attention. It's easy to hear the words of the father, son, you are always with me. All that is mine is always yours. And just write off the young man's outrage. What's to be upset about, the father really asks. You could literally have a party whenever you want. As if the party was really the problem. This morning, I invite us to explore this well-worn text. What does Jesus not tell us? What else could be at play here? How can this old story bring something new to us this morning? Think back with me. Remember how the father sees the prodigal son and runs to him? This implies that the father was scanning the horizon for any sign of his child. I wonder, how many sunrises and sunsets this parent spent looking, pleading with God, the universe, for his kid to come back home? How devastating was it for the older brother to watch his sibling spit on his father's life in exchange for money? How heart-wrenching was it for the son who stayed to see his parents' pain day after day? I wonder how many nights he lay awake, listening to his father cry himself to sleep, while confused tears streamed down into his own scruffy beard. I wonder how you would feel if after months of such heartache, you came home to news that your estranged sibling was cloaked in the finest robe and your parents' signet ring flashed as it slid onto the sunburnt finger of the disheveled boy who broke your heart. It's messy, isn't it? Seeing the other side of the story. For those who speak Enneagram, I'm a nine peacemaker with a fiery mama, uh, mama bear eight wing. Essentially, this means I really hate conflict unless you hurt someone I love. This is why I resonate with the older brother. I would 100% be conflict, conflicted at the return of the person who wrecked my family. And on top of that, we're throwing him a party? We're just gonna skate on over all the pain and confusion that the last months to years probably inflicted without talking about it. Cool, 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 cool. 
As I sat with this text this week, I started to think about the family dynamics at play. My internalized depictions of the characters set up blinders for how I interpret the story. The younger brother in my mind has always been a materialistic thrill seeker. The oldest brother is a devoted worker whose inflated ego and self-righteous uh, indignation makes him rather stubborn. The father is the wounded parent whose love and patience can weather any storm. But something about those dynamics didn't work for me anymore. I once had a professor who compared families to rubber bands. Each unit has a determined state of tension that holds everything together. Whenever that tension changes, the whole unit falls apart until it finally snaps back to how it used to be, or it settles into a new uh, level of tautness. It led me to wonder what tension broke this family. I wonder if the disconnect of the father and the creation of our party pooper was that he didn't realize that his children were searching for belonging. His youngest son maybe sought to find himself out in the material world, and the eldest seems to have lost all sense of his identity in order to appease his parent. When the father so quickly accepts the estranged son, it creates a bit of an identity crisis for our oldest. Where was this love and acceptance and joy when the oldest son needed it? Who was he if his father's approval was so easily earned? For the second time in this story, the rug is pulled out underneath him, and the oldest son has to basically roll with it. All of this begs the question, how does one restore relationship without merely brushing issues under the rug? I think it begins with reconciliation. To be reconciled is a mutual exchange of power, it's seeing the complexity of each part of the story. It's not shifting blame. Reconciliation, rather, is about accepting accountability for whatever part in the conflict that we played. Even notice the posture of the siblings, right? The youngest adopts a posture of shame in order to woo his father back to, uh, to his favor. And the oldest isolates himself because to be angry would mess up the family dynamics. What I find really interesting is that neither of the brothers ever face each other in this story. And the father just wants everyone to go back to their roles as if nothing happened. It's the, what's done is done, brush the dirt off of your shoulder, don't cry over spilt milk mentality that never asks why the milk was spilt in the first place. Ignore the problems. But reconciliation requires more vulnerability than that, more intentionality. One of my favorite spiritual practices is something that we do every single Sunday, and we don't really bring a lot of attention to it. And it's the passing of the peace. In Matthew chapter 5, we receive teachings on the importance of passing peace. Passing the peace is more than just a greeting to those around you. It's meeting each person's eyes, remembering that they bear the image of God, and offering reconciliation for whatever hardship is becoming between you and the other person. Jesus even teaches, if you are offering your gift at the altar and then remember that your sibling has something against you, leave your gift at the altar Go and be reconciled to your sibling, and then come back. To be reconciled to each other is more important to God than any offerings or worship experience. The psalmist puts it this way, For you do not delight in sacrifice, O God, or I would bring it. You take no pleasure in burnt offerings, or I would offer. The, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a repentant heart. I wonder how our story would have gone if the brothers had a chance to pass peace with one another. I wonder what would have happened if each looked into the other's eyes and saw the pain buried just beneath the dirt-smeared faces. I wonder if then they remember that this person was just as desperate for belonging as they were. Which leads me to my final question. Why did Jesus even start telling this tale to begin with? 
Do you remember? All the way back in verses 1 through 3, they say, Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen. And the Pharisees and scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them a parable. It seems our party pooper of an older brother has something in common with the Pharisees and scribes. And of course, this is not an excuse to use any anti-Semitic rhetoric, so let's just nip that in the bud at the beginning right now. You see, the Pharisees and scribes have everything in common with our older brother. These are members of a religious and ethnic group who have experienced generational hardship, enslavement, and disempowerment. They are currently under a political regime that will allow their existence as long as they do not ruffle any feathers, and you better not mess up the peace of the Romans. The scholars and priests are living in an era where their practices are not being targeted for the first time in centuries. They are about to have a beautifully built place of worship that is their own, and this Jesus is mucking all that up. Eating with sinners and tax collectors. It's as if he is wanting the Roman Empire to come down on all of their heads and reinstate violence against Jewish people. Remember our rubber band theory? The equilibrium is already taught, and Jesus is pulling the band tighter and tighter until it's just about to snap. And Jesus doesn't act like he's oblivious to these dynamics. No, he sees it, he smiles, and he begins to sing, every party has a pooper, that's why we invited you. We need the Pharisees and the scribes and the disgruntled siblings just as much as we need the sinners and the tax collectors. The moral of the story isn't, don't be a party pooper. Rather, it's, it's your party and you can cry if you want to. (laughs) Jesus sees the anger and disapproval for what it really is, fear, uncertainty, misplaced resentment. I don't think he's using this story or the others of similar messaging that surround this text as a slap in the face. I see Jesus doing what Jesus did best, building community through storytelling. What if Jesus was really trying to unite the sinners and the tax collectors, the Pharisees and the scribes? What if his message wasn't, this one is better than the other one? What if his message was, Y'all need each other. Really look and see the other. Perhaps for the very first time. See the doubt that you each are worried that you're not worthy of love and acceptance. See this and be reconciled. We've got work to do to transform this world. And the work starts with you closing the gap between each other. Perhaps that is the message for us in this world today. So may the peace of Christ be with you, and may we practice reconciliation every day. Amen.